Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the talk. I am Dhananjay Sati, and I will be talking to you about building a cloud platform for robots. Uh, the talk shall focus on what we're doing and how that relates to Kubernetes and the greater CNCF ecosystem. Right? Uh, that's my Twitter handle. You can reach out to me for queries at any point on that. So, Raputa is a cloud robotics company, and when we were still a research project, we used these stills to motivate the idea. How many of you recognize uh, these stills? Great. Um, so, for those of you who don't, uh, it's from the movie The Matrix that came out in 98. And it's a scene where Trinity is stuck on top of a skyscraper, and she's being chased by a gazillion Agent Smith clones. And the only way out is using a helicopter gunship, a B212 helicopter gunship. And so she does not know how to fly this helicopter. However, she's in the Matrix, which is a connected world. So she calls up Morpheus and gets the codes to fly the helicopter. And the badass that she is, she saves the day, right? And this idea stuck with us for a very long time. So what exactly does Trinity mean in the context of robots? It means two key things. Robots can download information and knowledge from the cloud and use it for their operations, or they can offload computation and storage to the cloud. This allows robots to get cheaper, lighter, and hence more ubiquitous. If you think about it, it's not very different from your mobile phone. A $100 mobile phone or a $1,000 mobile phone performs some of the most complex operations with equal ease, stuff like personal assistance or navigation. And they sort of leverage the cloud to do the same thing, right? So this was the founding idea behind creating the RoboEarth project. It was a cross-university, cross-lab collaboration backed by the European Union. I worked at ETH back then, and the idea was to create a cloud platform for robots. The main ideas were to abstract computation out, give an API-based interface to operators and users, and abstract stuff like hardware or knowledge databases or representations of the global world uh, into the cloud platform itself. Um, so let's sort of deep dive into what, what the objectives were and what, how we solved them, right? Uh, remember, this was in an era before Docker or Kubernetes existed, between 2009 and 2013. And one of the design goals of the platform was the ability to run it on a diverse set of compute environments, right? This could be something like AWS or Rackspace or even workstations inside a laboratory. And so what we did at that point was go with LXE containers and twist it. And that's, I think, what a lot of people were doing back then with container-based platforms. So we did that, and what you could do is add a simple container environment, which we call the compute environment, with, a, with something like a container tag that said Roomba clone to represent a Roomba robot that you just saw uh, in the previous talk, for instance. Okay? Now, that you had that environment, you needed a way of inserting ROS nodes into the same compute environment. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, ROS is basically a middleware that does some common things for you, like service discovery, or packaging uh, artifacts, or message passing, right? So what you could do is go to the API server and say, add this in this container, the Roomba node, add a particular node that does uh, rec uh, position recording, for instance, right? And this worked well. Ross sort of did everything within the compute environment. But to get to more complex applications, what you needed to do was link together multiple such robotic con compute environments. And the robot environment process that you had inserted inside each one of these environments was now responsible for sort of uh, channeling all this data and information flow between uh, various distributed compute environments and say, I want to publish this particular topic on this topic, uh, on this particular, with this particular type on this interface, right? And the good news in all of this is that it worked, right? And what you had, of course, in every other robot environment or any other cloud platform that you need to do is deal with the network problem. And what we did do at that point is you had a proprietary RCE control plane that basically coordinated everything between the task coordinators, the master task set, and the container controllers, uh, which was a proprietary protocol. All external communication used web sockets. And uh, networking used GREE tunnels and uh, LAN port mappings. We'll go into more details of this, but this is what it looked like at a high level. Um, and it worked. That's the good news. So what we were able to do is have two little Roomba robots that cost about $140 roam around the lab and perform SLAM with, uh, by using GPUs that sat in Amazon Island on remote and build these 3D maps. 
Some of our friends at TU Eindhoven were able to do mobile manipulation in different scenarios. So let's step ahead. We decided to form a company with the same ideas, and we did this about two years ago, and this was a, a completely different world. You had Docker, you had Kubernetes just coming out of 1.0, a lot of exciting things happening in the cloud space. So this is what we have right now when we started off with, we have a control plane, we have an API server, we have some sort of coordination between them, and you have a way of managing data flow within the platform, but it, didn't, it had its whole set of problems. So let's look into each one of the problems. The first one is containerization. Today we think containers are quite ubiquitous, but that wasn't the case back then. There was no standard of describing a container, and the only way of shipping a container was actually gzipping the entire root FS and passing that around. And we had a bunch of collaborators all across Europe, and we were trying to send these packets to them, and that often broke down, so we decided to start sending only the diffs, and that brings you to a whole set of new problems around dealing with dependency hell. And then you're trying to define the right interfaces, and often it's hard to do that because you really don't know what the right interfaces are, right? Uh, fast forward to today, what you have is basically Docker and pods. Now, at this conference, we have been discussing a lot of runtimes, but I think the two key takeaways from Docker is we have consensus in the whole world today about how to describe a container. At least a bulk of the world knows how a Docker file works. And once you execute the Docker build command, you can use the registry API to solve the problem of transporting those little blobs because you have sha signed images and their chains and their links. And that's a really powerful idea. Also, you don't need to make install the entire world into a single root FS because you can combine these things at runtime using pods and containers within pods. And moving ahead, you have Cryo, which gives you different runtimes and pluggable isolation, which is really useful if you're trying to run a production-based cloud platform. Uh, or trying to run different architectures within the same context. So that solves the containerization problem. The next problem is the control plane. The control plane was sort of segmented out. We dealt with two or three IaaS providers. So uh, scalability was an issue. Uh, we wrote this whole thing in Python Twisted. Uh, how many of you have actually used Python Twisted? Right. And this brings a big problem about day two operations and visibility into it. So the only way to debug Python Twisted is using something called a reactor, uh, a manhole in a reactor, and getting down that manhole is exactly as disgusting as it sounds uh, in reality. So that was definitely a problem, and hence maintainability and uh, modularity of code was a problem because no, not too many people enjoy writing Python Twisted. And the other problem was definitely to deal with IaaS providers. You wrote these plugs and hooks for different IaaS platforms. But they broke all the time because people changed stuff. I remember we had this problem when we were using EC2, and we relied on some very specific AVXI instruction sets, and we tried to execute code, and it didn't work. So we had to keep trying till AWS actually gave us a machine that reported what its hypervisor actually said it did. right? And that was a major problem. So Kubernetes sort of solves that problem for you. It is battle-tested at sufficient scale for these sort of applications. And the cloud providers now sort of fight with each other almost to maintain and have the best and the greatest features supported in Kubernetes, so you as a developer don't really need to deal with it. And it's a modular code base. I think I'm preaching to the church here when I say you can pick out things that the community has built. And a wise man once said, stand on the shoulder of giants and sort of use what the community is doing. And that's a really great thing uh, that really helped us accelerate our development. Last but not the least, and one of the most painful points always is networking when you're building a platform. So the first implementation, we had this beautiful idea that said, hey, let's maintain a global map of ports and nodes and sort of let, let, let a service discovery mechanism sort of ask you and figure out which port do I go to. Uh, we quickly discovered that was a bad idea. So we came up with a V2 implementation that used VXLAN and GREE tunnels, but those were the early days of Linux 3X and VXLAN implementations uh, tended to be flaky, so those broke. And when nodes disappeared, uh, reconfiguring everything or sort of notifying every single process saying, hey, something's changed, you need to go and fix it, was always an issue. So those are the kind of issues that you're dealing with. And all the external communication was ma maintained by these robot processes, and the master control plane had to sit and babysit each one of these processes, and that very quickly goes out of hand. So. In the Kubernetes world, I think this is something we talk about a lot. Uh, the CNI ecosystem is, uh, gives you high performance L2 and L3 networking. You have, uh, with, which basically enables you to use any host of 
L4 to L7 protocols that you choose, and this gives developers flexibility and does not make them rewrite the entire application using your proprietary protocol, and that is really important for developers to build more diverse applications. Um, also, DNS is a really good idea for service discovery, unless you have a, a specific reason why you don't want to use DNS, it is a great idea, it works in most languages, most uh, frameworks supported out of the box, so sort of rely on that. And the newest thing that we sort of really enjoyed was net policy. So in a lot of web application use cases, what you tend to do is you talk about tenants and you isolate uh, namespaces per tenant and say one tenant should not be able to talk to each other. But in a cloud robotics use case, you have a very real problem that the robot sits at a remote location in a warehouse somewhere or in a farm in the middle of nowhere, for instance, and someone can pick up that robot and run away with it, right? So what you want to do at that point is sort of limit the blast radius in your cloud platform and have isolation per robot instead of per tenant. So even if something did go wrong, you would limit the blast radius. It's very similar to the bulk heading design of, say, ship hulls, right? So uh, this is what we start with as an idea, and you see where we're going with this. I think this in itself demonstrates the power of what we've created together as a community of what Kubernetes and the CNCF ecosystem have enabled you to do. And we've sort of leveraged that to build our cloud platform, of course, with changes, uh, but we sit on top of a rock solid base and build ahead. So that helped us solve the data center problem, right? But where robots get really exciting or challenging is when you break out of the data center. You have compute that isn't necessarily bound to a data center. So at which point, when you address the problem, you run into a new set of issues. And they're daunting, yet they're a lot of fun. For instance, there's heterogeneity of compute, right? Inside a data center, there's very little variation in what you're actually running on. Yes, there are changes in certain processor versions, but it's vastly x86 slash 64 uh, processing units. And you have super reliable networks, which may not be the case, or which is definitely not the case when you're running on a remote location. And um, reproducibility and configuration is also a major thing. For a single drone to fly, for instance, you manage north of 150 parameters. And getting one of them wrong can cause the drone to crash. In fact, the Russians lost a satellite because they programmed the, long, uh, long, the wrong launch parameters at that point, right? Uh, so that's really important. And of course, there is latency issues. You cannot run a application in the cloud in US East 1 and expect the robot in Japan to run very well because they're super latency sensitive. You typically want to run in the same city or perhaps even want to put a Kubernetes cluster on the edge uh, to give you ultra low latency applications. Um, so let's look at a real world example. This is something we've been doing over the past one year. It is basically an autonomous drone that sits on its charging station. Uh, you open up, fire up Google Chrome, and fly the drone around in real time. Uh, latency means you can typically sit within the same continent. For instance, uh, we have an office in Bangalore, India, and we can open Google Chrome and fly the drone that in, in rural Japan, for instance. But uh, doing that over larger distances might be a concern purely because of latency issues. But uh, schematically, if you think about this problem, it is four different things coming together to make the application work. You have certain parts of the application sitting in the cloud, uh, often written by different teams. Something might be written in Golang or Python. Uh, in the cloud, you have some code running in the browser with JavaScript, probably React. You have something running on the edge, and typically your onboard software is in C or C++. Here I use different colors for different protocols because there are just so many different kinds of protocols that you use when you're dealing with robotics. It's, there's no one standard or there's no one right way of doing these things. It could be GRPC, it could be WebSockets, it could be WebRTC. There is absolutely a huge array of protocols that you deal with, typically. So this is the problem that you're dealing with. And one of the solutions that people say is, why don't you run Kubernetes on every single robot? and give kubelet to everybody. And this is what Kelsey Haitha said at KubeCon Austin last year, which says kubectl is the new SSH. And you're basically giving out kubectl to everybody and people are abusing it and you're coming up with these hundreds of different RBAC policies. And the more problematic thing here is robotics is already super complicated. And what you're doing is adding one more level of complexity. We all out here love Kubernetes and understand it, but to a person from a completely different domain, it can be often very daunting. So you don't want to expose those things. And this is very similar to what the guys at Kubeflow said earlier in the conference, saying, you have these ML experts, let's not 
introduce Kubernetes to them, let them just use the power of Kubernetes and sort of compose higher order applications. So how do you expose Kubernetes, the power of Kubernetes to them, without exposing the complexity of it? Um, and we find that it is good to use higher order abstractions. So one of the higher order abstractions that we actually came out with is something we call a package. Now a package is basically an abstraction that runs anywhere, be it the cloud, be it the edge, be it the robot. It offers a uniform set of tools and a uniform set of APIs, and it should have a declarative runtime. So what do I mean by a declarative runtime here, right? Um, this is an example of a declarative runtime where I say, this is my package. Uh, it, it's a really simple example. It's a cloud pub sub. I, I'm, running, I'm running a listener on the cloud, and because it's the cloud, I can do fancy stuff like TLS termination or replicas. And uh, on, I want to run something on the device. On the device, in a more complex example or a real world example, I would give features saying, hey, this should be a drone or this should have these GPI opens and these sequences and so on. And of course, you, can give, you need something to execute on the robot, so you can point it to a Docker container that could be private or public, or you could point it to a GitHub repository where you want to build artifacts from. So this is a very simple example, but uh, the first problem that you need to solve to actually make this work is the heterogeneity problem. So what you can do is, again, reuse what you find good in the community. And we've had so many products, so many talks about building CI and CD systems. And I think we're getting to a point where it's just a matter of picking the tool that works for you to build Docker containers. And what we did do in this case was uh, use OpenShift. They have really good build controllers that help you build uh, Docker containers. And you can use some nifty tricks to sort of run cross compiles using Kemu and actually do native builds for ARM architectures. And for anybody who's actually built software for the ARM architecture, building it on the board is a terrible idea because it's painstakingly slow and it probably won't work in most cases, right? Um, and let's also recognize that we live in a world where a lot of devices will and do not run Docker. And for these devices, you still need to build artifacts that are binary artifacts. But the idea is the same, right? The, the core idea is you're taking a bunch of source code, using a, some sort of transformation to arrive at strategies and architectures, and then you have a build phase, which yields artifacts. So there are great projects in the Kubernetes community today, uh, such as Project Argo, that you can leverage to build these artifacts with a workflow that each developer can define in a distinctly different way, depending on what he's trying to build for, right? Uh, is that enough? The question we often ask is, is that enough? And that was also the question that uh, a bunch of people put forth to the Kubeflow guys, is cool, now you have applications, you have a way of building them, but how do you actually compose them? Think about a problem. Today when you build a shopping website, you don't start building a web server, you don't start with building a payments gateway. You sort of put these few things together and you quickly sort of focus on selling your teddy bears, for instance. And that's great, that's how it should be. However, in robotics, we're not doing that. And what you really want to do is allow people to reuse other people's work. For instance, if I am a person who knows how to make great electromechanical systems, I, I should not need to get a PhD in navigation theory to figure out how to make my robot move from point A to point B, right? Uh, so what you want to do is permit coupling of these applications. That also brings uh, forth another really important point. Even within a single robotics firm, what you typically have is different teams use completely different vocabularies, completely different tool sets and languages to actually build and develop their applications. And they want to test that. They want all beautiful things like CI, CD, and SEMVR. But you want a coupling to be frozen before you actually put it out in the real world. Move fast and break things is not the smartest of ideas in the physical world because that can lead to serious damage and even loss of life and limb, right? So, uh, to give you an idea of composition, let me take this example. You are, for instance, a drone manufacturer. You build beautiful drones that fly around, but you know nothing about low latency video streaming. And you shouldn't, right? What you could do is take your teleoperation package, add, simply import a package that says, hey, I do video streaming. Now that you have the same package and you have the same, very same tool sets and APIs in place, uh, what you do is execute this 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, and sort of use the same tools and behavior. Or another app example would be when you want to maintain two things, but use the same API, but have completely different life cycles. For instance, I want to set up a mapping server, and then robots inside the warehouse come and go, and sort of use and consume this mapping data, 
and you want this very same API every single time. So how do you achieve that? I, I, I know all this sounds really interesting, but how do you actually get there? And there happens to be a very powerful toolkit in our arsenal uh, called the Open Service Broker API. Uh, how many of you are actually aware of what the Open Service Broker API is? Great. So primarily, the Open Service Broker API, uh, some people have talked, a lot of people have been talking about it in the conference, is a way of reasoning, granting, asking for resources, provisioning and deprovisioning them that yield a set of credentials. Uh, credentials contain coordinates and configuration of how to use a particular resource. Essentially, you can use a robot or a Twitter account or a hard disk or a particular cloud provider in exactly the same way, right? So when you do a provision request, you create a resource. When you do a bind request, you get these credentials. And now you can consume these credentials, right? And we want the platform to be extendable, and it has to be extendable because you have so many combinations of algorithms and hardware and all these things. So what you do is take this I.O. package that we talked about earlier and create a metadata representation of it, it that helps the platform sort of reason about the package, stuff like labels and selectors. And you also create a service class representation out of it and shove the whole thing behind the Open Service Broker API. Now you have standard tooling, standard methodologies of how to deal with Open Service Brokers. So what you could do is create a platform broker, send a request to it that says create provision bind and bind, and what this platform broker does is then cascades it to a second level of brokers, and it's quite interesting why we do this. For instance, uh, here we have a device broker and a cloud broker, and perhaps other IaaS brokers. So what you would do is if you wanted to render a part of the application graph on the cloud, the device, the cloud broker would kick in and say, hey, I'm going to handle this, and talk to the cloud controller and render the application graph into the cloud using something like Helm or templates. We use Helm in this case. And what you get is all the fancy features of Kubernetes, your edges, your services, pods, deployment configs, all the great things. And now you get the credential set and go to the device broker and say, hey, buddy, why don't you connect up to this endpoint on the cloud? And it uses exactly the same semantics, so you sort of reuse them and compose this, the application use some sort of a control channel to the device, the device connects up, and you have a complete application graph deployed across the cloud and the robot uh, that works together in unison, and you have the very same API to now bind, unbind, destroy, or create these uh, service class representations. And it's also really simple to extend them and include features that providers bring in to the table uh, because you're using the Open Service Broker API. Uh, here's an example. It's a very, very short example, but uh, one second. Uh, so here what we're doing is we have different kinds of robots. You have like a turtle bot, you have a, a drone, and you have two little robots, and they all have completely different chips on them. And from the web browser, you can select different kinds of behavior. And in this case, they all are on different uh, in different offices on different floors, and you have a guy trying to control them with a simple uh, PS2 controller. And what you see is the robots move in tandem or in unison. And since all of them are sort of linked up and follow the same protocol or behavior, they could mimic each other or they could sort of follow anti-patterns to each other. Now, this example could very well be, uh, very well be used in other cases like uh, following workers around a factory to help them like load stocks or uh, drones going in swarms to achieve a certain mission, right? Uh, so this is the kind of power that you can actually unlock with cloud-connected robots, and uh, Kubernetes has helped us a long way in getting here. Um, thank you. Um, so, uh, sorry, a time for questions, actually. Oh, man. Acknowledgements also to my team uh, back home in India and, and our lab partners at ZHJW at ETH and uh, the University of Zurich. So questions, sorry. Okay. Thank you. No, we're not running cryo on the robot nodes. Uh, we are actually running uh, the mo uh, custom version of the Mobi project on the robots, on some of the robots that allow us to do that. Or simple, uh, like if it's a Raspberry Pi, we just run uh, Docker. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you.